All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. Uh, as always, I'm Jay-Z of Jay-Z's Reptiles and all that other good nonsense. Um, with me today, we have a really cool guest who is honestly a lot more popular than I originally thought when I first uh, came across her. Uh, this is uh, Precious Robbins, the owner and proprietor of Precious Pythons, a really cool YouTube channel, and we're just going to get right into that. So how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Oh, okay. Good. You know, good Good and bad, good and bad. Really tired. Yeah, save. I just woke up from a nap. <laughs> Oh, I get that. I just tried to take a nap. New puppy won't let me do that. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so um, let's just get into this. So, um, you know, you have a pretty decent sized following on YouTube and all that stuff. Uh, but how did you first get started into reptiles? Um, I would say, you know, um, I've always had like a curiosity for reptiles and animals. Um, it started really young. Uh, my first reptile was I was a kid, uh, probably uh, around nine years old. Uh, my dad had bought me and my siblings a um, an iguana. You know, uh, her name was Jade, and you know we were fascinated fascinated by her. But um, typically, iguanas aren't like the nicest, so you know we weren't really allowed to like hold her and touch mm -hmm. her. So we just admired her from a distance, and he did all the care and handling of her. Um, and then recently. Um, I didn't have an I didn't have a reptile pet, you know, in between that time, um, and then I had a uh, my son who is allergic to like fur babies, dogs, cats, and everything, and he wanted a pet, um, so he asked me for a bearded dragon uh, and a leopard gecko, um, which we went ahead and got that. I did some research, and um, he not too long after that asked me for a snake um, which I was a little hesitant about just because you know it's just not your typical ask of a pet and I didn't really know much about snakes at all um so initially I said no um and then he kind of wore me down a little bit and I did some research and I you know was googling and on Facebook and eventually I fell in love with bull pythons, um, mm -hmm. just like over, you know, the computer. Um, and then, um, w before I w actually bought one, I looked, I ran into a girl on Facebook that was keeping about 20 ball pythons uh, in her, in a collection mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. And, um, I reached out to her, I messaged her and asked her, um, you know, what care was required to keep one and just had just general questions. And she eventually invited me over her house to like see one and hold one in person which I did and from there it was you know all she wrote I got my first ball python after that and within about a month I had like five of them so it, yeah that sounds different. about right <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it went from uh your son asking can I have a ball python to now I have all the bulbs <laughs> yeah it's, it's so funny because when I after he had asked that I had got maybe like maybe 12 I'm like, come on, Nate, you got to help me clean these snakes. He's like, I asked for one snake and you got a bunch of them. That's like your problem. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly the same thing. Every time my partner says that she wants something, it's like, okay, cool. Like, hey, I really think the ducks are cute. I'm like, oh, really? And then now we have, a, then we get a flock of like 15. It's bad. Right. <laughs> so. That's hilarious. Yes. <laughs> so... Um, I haven't watched too, too many of your YouTube videos, but uh, the ones that I have watched, they're really nice. Honestly, I'm a little bit jealous. Um, but you. <laughs> do you keep any other snakes other than just ball pythons? I do not. I actually um, do have an interest um, in getting into other species. Um, eventually, I do want to keep carpet pythons and boas, cool. um, but I just don't have the space. And um, at this time, like where I'm, where I'm living, um, but that's about to change because I just bought a house and uh, it's being built. So um, I will have a good amount of space to start keeping the things that I really desire to keep. Now, I think it is going to stay heavily like ball pythons. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll probably, and I don't think I'll get into like breeding other species for some time. Um, but I do have an interest on keeping the boas and the carpet pythons and then possibly getting into colubrids. So, you know, we'll just see how that works out. <laughs> That's cool. At least you're doing it kind of, you know, smart and, you know, fairly pragmatically about it because yeah. <laughs> instead of, you know, as we all tend to do and immediately get one snake, three snake, eight snakes, yes. 
At least you're sticking with something that, you know, you have the room for, at least for now. I know how addictive it can be. So I just don't want to, I'm the kind of person where, you know, I go from like zero to a hundred. So like, if I get, you know, one, or if I get into something, then I just go full on. There is no like chill at all. So I'm trying to be smart about it. (laughs) I totally get that. Um, So what was it about ball pythons that you decided was like the perfect fit for you? Well, I think um, it's funny because everybody tells you or you at least read about them being like a beginner snake. Yeah. Um, the more that I kind of get into like bull pythons, I I can see where that could, you know, be an um, a, a true statement. But I don't know if I would ever um, advertise bull pythons as like a beginner snake just because they can be so... Um, finicky when it comes to like their care like their husbandry has to be absolutely on par if you have a responsible person you know that you know can take care of this animal it absolutely is a beginner snake but if you have somebody that um you know is just wanting i don't know i I guess if once you get them started up and set up you don't Mm -hmm. really have to do much monitoring right but you just have to make sure that you're diligent you buy everything that you need to buy and you know have everything that you need to have to take care of these animals after that it's it's so easy but um so again it it could be a beginner snake at the same time i you know i can see that why people say it's not um but i personally um got into it because initially when i read about like their temperament and how they're docile um to be quite honest, the colors and the patterns of yeah. like the morphs and genetics is what really like caught my eye. Because you see boas, even like after I got into ball pythons, when I started looking at boas, um, I can't say that I was like really like enthralled by like the boas, like the pattern. Like, you know, sometimes you have certain boas that have that pattern and then it changes when it gets close to the tail. Um, but the colors don't change too, too much. You know, um, with ball pythons, it's like, thousands and thousands of different genetics that you know you can get into so I would say it was definitely um the look of them that got me into you know that particular species of snake okay fair enough that that's totally fine and I absolutely get it because every time I go and talk to like a person who almost exclusively or like that's their main thing is balls and then they show me all of their really cool projects and the crazy high-end stuff that because I'm kind of middle of the road with ball pythons. I go, I want to get some of those. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Every single Absolutely. time. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that my the first expensive ball python that I purchased was maybe like my fourth or fifth one. You know, it was just like I made a decision. And it wasn't until after I made that decision to purchase an expensive snake that I decided, let you know, why not start producing these and make something of this? Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, like it didn't take long to like look at one that was pricey and beautiful and say, I'm going to get that snake. (laughs) You know, but when you talk to other people about how much they cost, especially people that don't know much about the hobby or reptiles, and you're telling people, yeah, you know, this snake is, you know, $2,500. They're like, what? Yeah. why you know (laughs) but you don't hear people like so shocked that you spent five thousand dollars on a dog you know like a purebred dog you know you don't you don't Mm -hmm. see people that shocked by that but when you talk about snakes they're like baffled you know there's just they don't believe that you could spend that much on a on a reptile oh yeah and i mean even now i mean compared to what ball pythons were when they first exploded back in like the early 2000s yes even 2.5k that's yeah (laughs) Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, with that in mind, uh, what do you mind sharing? Kind of what projects that you are mostly focusing on and moving towards? Yeah. So, um, I right now am pretty heavily into desert ghosts. Um, I would say that's where my biggest investments probably lie. Um, are the desert ghost and hypo project. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like here recently. Um, I have not done the um, unboxing yet, um, but I did pick up a couple of new um, Desert desert Ghost morphs just last week. Um, And I'll just go ahead and share that here. Um, You know, but the, I have a, I just purchased a pastel super edgy um, Desert Ghost male. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah, so he's beautiful. And I do plan, I have really, really great plans with him breeding wise. Um, I have a few females 
that are actually ready uh, that he'll be paired to um, this season. And then I also purchased a champagne hypo desert ghost male. Um, and then as a, as a sort of a backup male just in case anything happens with that male and I need another desert ghost powerhouse to kind of like go to my females um and then I bought a firefly desert ghost female that will be paired eventually to one of those males uh but she was she's breeding size um and she just laid for the for for the breeder that I bought her from uh so she won't be ready until next next year when she gets back on food and everything but um so yeah so those are those are a few snakes that I picked up recently um that I'll be working with but very much into desert ghost clown and i would say pied right now so Mm -hmm. yeah that's really cool i'm actually really interested i don't think i've ever seen a champagne with desert ghost that sounds really cool yeah like she looks almost uh like fake like you know it doesn't even look (laughs) i'm sorry he is a male but it's just like it's just crazy how I don't even know what the word would be to describe the animals when you put desert ghost and hypo together. Yeah. It's almost like a a paint effect. It's so it's just so indescribable. But yeah, I'm really, really excited to work with that project. That is really cool. That's that's definitely the one project I really do need to get going into because most of my stuff is like the bells and the pies, mm-hmm. but and a little bit of the highway stuff. But I really wanted to get into Desert Ghost, and now you're like the third person that's working with it. I'm just like, why didn't you do that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, when I first saw a Desert Ghost morph, I fell in love with the colors, and that was just a single gene Desert Ghost, not knowing what it did to other. Oh my god, and it's just crazy what it does so um hopefully you know it won't be this season this season i i do have an opportunity to hatch some desert ghost visuals um i have a female that's building follicles um that was paired she's a she's a visual desert ghost single gene and she was paired to a super chocolate hypo het desert ghost so Hmm. i do have an opportunity to hopefully hatch out some chocolate um Des, uh, chocolate desert ghost head hypos um or it'll be you know chocolate head and then double heads but yeah uh, we will see you know how that works out i'm super excited uh to see what that produces but um other than that i do have some females i did lay this year um and then some that will be laying um a little bit a few months from now um my highway girl laid last month nice or this month and then in april i had my um pied girl late that she will be producing some visual pieds for me as well so this will be my first season producing so we'll see this is your very first season producing ball pythons yes (laughs) oh my god you're just like go big or go home good lord (laughs) so hopefully i'm crossing my fingers that it's a good season but yeah i'm excited (laughs) no i mean that's that's amazing that's really cool like that's most people don't do that. Most people are rolling around. We're like, yeah, my pastel hooked up. All right. All right. Guilty. <laughs> That's amazing. That's really cool. Like, I honestly thought you were, you know, two or three years into this of producing already. That's nuts. I wish. I wish. I wish. I wish. But, you know, I'm excited for the some of my projects will really, really be taking off the ground on my third year. So that's like where I'm going to be like blackhead clowns. I actually hopefully will produce some blackhead clowns visuals next season so oh, i actually wow. have that that pairing um i've had two locks from my blackhead girl and my pastel head clown and um i'm growing up a, a visual female clown that will be ready hopefully beginning of next year and she can be paired to a blackhead head clown so we'll see how that happens if i can you know but you know you never know ball pythons i've had projects where i'm like yeah i'm gonna make this and i'm gonna make that and then the girl gets to like 1200 grams and then stops eating and you're like you want to ruin me <laughs> you know it's just like why are you doing this? oh yeah <laughs> no i get i get that i have a four-year-old ball python who is just now at 15 yeah yeah i have a lot of girls that just they're like, yeah, we're not eating we're just gonna stop right 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 here yep. <laughs> but yeah <laughs> that's really cool so how many how many balls do you have going at this point with the three that i just picked up not including what the eggs that are in the incubator i think i'm at 41 yeah 
I should be at 41. I have to recount, but I, I should be That's at still pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a huge collection by, you know, other people's standards. That's an amazing collection that you have, like, all those really high-end genetics. Thank you. I absolutely got into this saying that I didn't want to have a collection over 50 in the apartment that I was, that I'm living in right now. And obviously I'm going to surpass that number uh, quickly, but with some of the males that I've recently got compared to the animals that I've got my very first, like banana ball Python, which was, you know, pastel banana head clown, you know, um, there are some snakes that I want to part with mm-hmm. that, that I'm no longer like interested in working with. And it's like, you have that, like that torn feeling because I you know, some, snakes i was like oh this is i can never part with this snake because of this sentimental you know value yep. atta- attached to it and now i'm just like i gotta make room <laughs> i gotta make room for more stuff that i want to work with and uh so that's gonna be really difficult because i didn't want to sell anything at all until i sold my very first snake produced by me mm-hmm. um so I'm, that might not happen because i have like i have maybe like six males that i just you know, you guys are just, you know, taking up space and food and, you know, I don't plan on working with you and somebody else might want to work with these animals. So um, it's very possible I might sell them before I produce, before my eggs hatch in a couple of weeks. So we'll see um, what happens. But two weeks I have snakes hatching and then three weeks the second clutch will hatch. So yay. And then the joy of feeding baby ball pythons. Yes. That, that, and it's so crazy. Like being in this, this hobby, you know, I feel like there's so many stages of learning, you know, like I started off doing this and I had to learn how to care for regular, you know, ball pythons, having to grow them up and getting, getting them on food when they went off food and learning different setups and how to keep in tanks, how to keep in plastic tubs, how to keep in racks, just different things. And then, you're dealing with now like pairing and breeding and how to do that. You know, there are different tricks that you can do to get animals to lock because I definitely had to experience putting two snakes together and like, why aren't you guys locking, you know, <laughs> and having to figure out the tricks that they, that'll get them to do that. And then went on to like, you know, identifying when a female is ovulating and how, when she's building and palpating, and it's just been like a learning experience after learning experience after learning experience. And now, you know, my most recent learning experience was like putting those, pulling those eggs from that girl and putting, setting up the egg box and putting them in the incubator. And now I feel like, Oh God, now I got to figure out how to get baby ball pythons on food. And it's just like I said, learning experience after learning experience. It's just, it's so satisfying. I can't yep, even. It words. never ends. Right. Never. Like there's always going to be something that you're going to be learning when you're in this industry. And I mean, just, just the morph identification alone, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy. You have big breeders that are producing six, seven gene snakes and they're like, I don't know what's in this animal yet. You know, they're still learning as well. So it's just crazy. Oh yeah. No, I've, I've literally had a conversation with people at nerd and they go, well, it's this, 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 and this. And there might be this, 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 and this, and this. And we're working with this new gene, and we're not really sure what that is. So it might be doing this, but it might be doing this to this, and this, and this. It's it's insane. (laughs) It is. I mean, it is the epitome of a hobby, seriously. Like, it just doesn't get any more, um, I don't know. I feel like it's just, it's it's a thing that helps you if you allow it to, like, helps you grow and keeps you occupied and keeps you interested and, it's fascinating, you know, absolutely fascinating. <laughs> You're, yeah, no, it absolutely is. And that's, uh, I find myself torn a lot wanting to work with like every species ever yes. and then playing Frankenstein with all of the awesome right. genetics too. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's one. The, and then and that's another thing too, because I know I have to get like these baby ball pythons on food, but I also have to identify genetics. And one thing I have tried to do is, be familiar with the snake genetics that I have specifically in my collection, just so that I know what I'm hatching, you know, over here at Precious Pythons. Um, But I know that is going to be a challenge, you know, because it's it's different identifying, being able to identify a single gene Mm -hmm. is different than being able to identify four genes put together and what they're doing to each other. So it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. That's awesome. Do you have like a do you have like a reptile guru where you're at? Like a couple of like old school people that are always, they're always Definitely. like poking at. 
<laughs> yeah, so I, there are a few people here in Indy that have been working with Volpythons for quite some time. You have Circle City Constrictors over here, DCI Exotics. Uh, there's another breeder, Baker Sturgeon, who's been doing this since um, he was like pretty much walking, like, you know, as a, as a child, like, you know, um, where his parents were into breeding and, it, and it, they like indoctrinated him into the hobby. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, I'm definitely, definitely going to be leaning on them for, you know, advice. And then you have other breeders that I've just gotten started along with me. Um, Ryan Hayes, 3-1 South Exotics. He he had his first breeding season last year, but he's, you know, like I said, just pretty much just as new as me. And we kind of bounce things off of each other all the time. We, we literally talk every single day. Like, I never would have thought that I would, like, he, I'm closer to him. I consider my, him my best friend than I am with people outside of the reptile community. And I just never thought that that would ever have happened, you know, getting into this. It is kind of weird that you just like meet people and then you just establish these bonds with someone that you yeah. never would have thought you'd ever be yeah. just running in the circles with. Seriously, like, and it's so crazy because like, you know, he has a two kids and a wife and super close to them. I go over there. They invite me over for dinner. Like, it's just amazing. If I'm like, you know, even with my personal life, I'm going out on a date. I send in my location like, hey, <laughs> I'm not at home right now. And if I don't make it home, you make sure you call the police. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, like we're just so close. I just never thought I would have mixed, you know, my personal life with, you know, that this particular hobby or interest. You know, I just never thought I, that would happen. And it feels really, really great to do that because people who aren't doing this don't understand it even slightly. Like they have, they don't, even people who support you, which I am glad to say that every single one of my family members to a degree supports mm -hmm. what I'm doing. It's to a degree because I have some that won't ever come to my house anymore, but they're just like, oh, you're dope. <laughs> you can do this. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More power to you from a distance, you know, know. so exactly you know, they're all very supportive but like i said it's just not the same you know they could never be as supportive as somebody who has the same interest you know and then of course you have people that do have the same interest that aren't supportive either because some people don't want you to succeed you know so you have to be careful about who you kind of associate with so yeah it, it's just so i i feel very very lucky um and i I guess just, yeah, just lucky that I had the experience that I have going into this. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. It sounds like you had a pretty good go. I haven't had any too many uh, toxic individuals in your life or anything like that, at least no. as far as this goes. Yeah, for sure. I can't say that I have at all. Well, that's absolutely amazing. I really wish that everyone could have, you know, yeah, those sorts of things. But um, with that in mind, so, you know, you've you're still fairly new to the hobby in general. So what, maybe three, four, five years in at this point? Yes, two and a half years. Two and a half years, yeah. So you're still pretty fresh to the hobby Very. and you're already this far on. Not taking that away from you whatsoever. That's amazing. And now you're a very a fairly successful YouTube personality. What made you decide that you wanted to start up a, a social media education platform? Well, I just found that it was like, it was really hard to find some information that I was looking for, particularly like on mm -hmm. YouTube when it came to the hobby. Um, you have a lot of Facebook groups. They're very, very, very informative, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's still some misinformation out there, but a lot of people, I, including me when I first got into this, I didn't feel comfortable um, asking questions or like, you, you know kind of like putting myself out there in the groups because some people can be very um I guess for lack of better words just mean you know um yeah. and it kind of keeps people from you know really hesitant to reach out because um people will use that you know against you so um I wanted to kind of create a place where people could you know ask those questions and be beginners and not have to feel ashamed about it right um so and then i just wanted to share the journey like i was learning as i was going and i felt like somebody else could be learning as they were going to mm -hmm. um and you know just like i said and, and then just documenting I, I i thought it would be cool to cause i do plan on doing this for a i plan on doing this for a long time and i felt like documenting this from the very beginning because my very first youtube video I mean, that was it. Like that was, you know, maybe <laughs> a couple months in and um, I just thought it'd be cool to have like a story to kind of tell like that journey, um, I like that. which I would definitely say has 
transformed into something that I didn't even think it was gonna gonna be you know so <laughs> I, but I I will say kind of it kind of ended up being useless because I can't even dare go back and watch my old videos because I'm, it's they're so cringy like I'm just like oh, I'm yeah. not gonna watch that <laughs> it's hard to watch myself so oh I feel you on that one for sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> for sure <laughs> Cool. So you kind of touched on a little bit and, you know, the kind of like gatekeeping that happens with some of the people that have been along for a long time. And it seems like, again, that you didn't have too much of like any sort of like toxic individuals or anything like that. But did you ever have to deal with any like kind of gatekeeping or like kind of breaking through stereotypes or anything, both in the hobby, people in your life or outside of outside of the hobby that are just like, "Mm -mm," or whatever it was well when you say stereotypes i I mean because i felt like when i first started doing this a lot of people tried to put me like in this box like that Mm -hmm. i was supposed to be this particular individual like um a lot of people outside of the reptile community were you know was in the beginning my family was supportive some of them took some time kind of getting on board but it was just like why are you doing this you know you're black you shouldn't be doing this (laughs) this is not a black thing to be doing (laughs) <laughs> you're black and you're a woman you know why, why you know why do you want to do this you know it was very much and then when people couldn't accept that I'm a black woman into this particular you know um field it was just like are you a witch are you sure you're not like a witch like everybody oh, wanted man. so badly for me to be like this practicing witch or wiccan it was weird you know and it was just like uh that took some time to break through that um <laughs> Um, And then I would say, like, as far as the actual hobby went, um, a lot of people did not take me seriously. Um, And I feel like it was likely because I'm a female in the hobby. And, you know, um, I've dealt very heavily. It took me a long time to meet other women in the hobby. Now I have a healthy, healthy amount of women that I can connect with in the hobby that I didn't know were even there. And I think that that's how all women start off in this hobby. They're just like, wow, I didn't know so many women are doing this. And now we know that there are, there are Facebook groups of women keepers with reptiles and bull pythons and what have you. Um, But I would say that was maybe the hardest is because I was in groups like Instagram, private groups, Facebook, private groups um, of small, um, small communities um, where it was just men and me. (laughs) And it would have, what would happen is they would be having a conversation and I would be like trying to add to the conversation about like different morphs or different, you know, whatever question. Mm. And it was like, I wasn't even speaking. <laughs> People uh. wouldn't even acknowledge the the text if I would like, you know, it was just like, I didn't talk. Like, so, um, which when I was talking, when I was trying to connect, I, the questions I would ask and the comments I would make would completely go ignored. Um, and that happened for a while until I started getting some really, really nice genetics in my collection. Mm-hmm. And then it went from, you know, people started kind of noticing that I was getting like certain things and people were, you know, asked, I got some rude things, you know, where people would ask, you know, what are you doing for these snakes? Or, you know, there was some suggestions that like, I was like doing some like backdoor things or because I'm beautiful, people were giving me discounts for these snakes or whatever, when I'm buying them off more market where the person cannot see me just like you. Right. <laughs> so, um, that happened and that was kind of off-putting but I kind of take everything like with the great assault you know um, I don't try to take anything too personal unless it's just like blatant racism or like sexism or whatever so yeah um you know that that kind of happened in the beginning but it didn't last for too long I think that when people realize how serious I was you know doing this um you kind of have to like it kind of commands respect you know um so and I, I'm serious I want to know as much as possible um when I'm having a conversation with somebody about ball pythons um you know I'm trying to soak up as much knowledge as possible and I, what I'm putting out is knowledge you know it's not like oh really so you know I don't know I don't even know what they expect out of a woman to like be <laughs> doing but it's just I'm taking it very seriously very serious like this is an investment for me my money is going into this and I'm a single mom you know doing everything I do in my personal life by myself and anything that I put my money into I take seriously so I think that kind of you know like I said I think people pick up on that eventually yeah I'm really glad too because it's I never understood like the mansplaining part of of this hobby when there's like the Kathy Loves and the Tracy Barkers who will have forgotten more in the last two years about 
any and all thing reptiles that 99% of us will ever learn. Right. And why there's still that like, hmm, it's okay, pretty girl. Like, I really <laughs> hate, I, I, that always really bugged me a little bit. Like, I don't, I don't see it too much, but every time I do, I'm like, what is, no, what, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. like really surprised when, you know, um, it would happen. And it's just like, and you're right, it does bother you. Like, it's just like, you know, you didn't think that people have this mentality, but I think it's a, I guess it's the same thing with anything, you know, there's going to be ignorance you know yeah associated with it and you're gonna have certain people and you know you just have to I guess deal with it but um I'm glad I don't have to deal with it as much so but I know that there are women out there that are still are and it's unfortunate yeah I think it's just really it kind of hurts a little bit more personally sometimes because it, it sounds kind of like you had a little bit when you're younger but you didn't really get into it until you're an adult yeah and you found this thing that like oh, this is what I was meant to do and be and be a part of and then it's like the same icky is there too as everywhere else and they're just kind of like oh man yeah you come on because <laughs> you know I definitely I have other interests where like um I'm really into like hair care and like herbal like um you know combining like herbal care and like ailments into like my life and so I was working with a lot of herbs making like lotions making hair treatments making salves and Mm -hmm. ointments all kinds of things um and literally extracting herbal medicine from herbs and putting them into different products and I liked doing it but I learned as I was into it I liked doing it for myself when I when it got to like selling it to other people doing other people's hair I love doing my hair but when another woman asked me to like do her hair I'm just like oh I don't want to (laughs) no please don't make me sit here for you know four hours and do this you know um so it's just like but I I love doing those things but then I learned that it had a, it had a limitation, you know, like, Mm -hmm. okay, I like doing it like this, but I'm not going to go this far. When it came to like the reptile community and ball pythons, it wasn't like, oh, I love these animals and I like keeping them, but I would never breed them. I would never sell them. No, I wanted to like completely jump in. And I thought to myself, man, I'm going to be doing this. And then I'm going to realize, oh man, I don't, this is too much. I don't want to do this anymore. And it just never got to that point and um you know I feel like I've been doing it for quite some time where it's just hasn't reached that point um and I don't think that it's going to I was expecting it to long before now you know mm-hmm. long before two and a half years in um kind of just waiting on that moment where I'm like yeah I don't want to do this anymore and it just it never came so <laughs> I'm really excited that I feel like I found my passion period you know yeah I'm glad yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that stays with you too, because as soon as you have to start dealing with people that are going to be trying to buy your babies, oh. that's where it can get kind of hard. Yeah, I heard about. I've heard horror stories. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, um, you take the good with the bad. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> I, I think I'd honestly rather have the like two week long conversation with someone that asks the same questions over and over again. But at least I know they. At least it seems to me like they care. Yeah, that's a little true. bit. I'd almost right. rather have that than just kind of like the, you know, yeah, here you go. Bye. Yeah, exactly. Because I think my very first bow python that I bought, I bought from uh, Jake Milbrandt with Milbrandt and Capinetto Pythons. Mm. And he produced for me one of the most amazing customer seller experiences that it made me want to do it. You know, I think that that was my first, like just, it was so pleasant to buy from him. You know, he was so nice when I just didn't know shit about fall pipe. I'm sorry by my language. <laughs> You're fine. Everyone slips up and it's, I, I didn't, I didn't have like a, you know, anything at the beginning. It's like, Hey, kids watch this. Okay. Let's You're Perfect. fine. You're totally fine. But, uh, but yeah, he, pr- he provided me with like just the perfect experience where it made me feel like I, I was glad I spent that amount of money. Um, and I would have never thought I would have, and it was a small amount of money, but for me, it was a lot of money because it was a pet, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and I felt to like thought to myself, like I didn't have any kind of remorse buying that animal. I had asked ridiculous questions, <laughs> which they weren't ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? There are beginner questions that I know I'm going to get to, you right. know, but he didn't make me feel any kind of way about not knowing anything. It was just a really, really great experience. And I always tell myself that when I'm 
selling and providing that experience for someone else, I need it to be like that, if not even better, you know? Right. Uh, Cause now as a, I, I don't consider myself a breeder just yet, but you know, soon, but and you got eggs in the incubator. <laughs> That's <is> true. <laughs> but you know, as someone who has a, a, a decent sized collection, um, I've now dealt with breeders that were not pleasant at all. Like, they're just like, okay, yeah, I don't think I want to spend my money with you again. Even though I know I'm still, I could still buy this snake. It could be the best snake. You know, I've had, I've had interactions with breeders where I was ready to drop $2,000 on a animal and they were so impersonable and unpleasant that I was just like, I'll find somebody else to spend my money with. Because at the end of the day, when I buy an animal from somebody, I'm going to go on my YouTube. I'm going to promote you. I'm going to shout you out. I'm going to tell people to go and buy from you. And I don't feel comfortable doing that because you didn't provide me with, you know, what I would have wanted when, when I'm spending my money with you. So I want to make sure that when someone buys a snake from me, that they felt their money is well spent and that they feel like the, the communication, the line of communication will always stay open in case they ever have a question, whether it's, my snake isn't eating, what do I do to, you know, oh my God, I just got my first clutch from the animal that you sold me. Was there any other genetics in there that, you know, might not have been listed, whatever, you know? So I just, I want that to always stay open. Um, So I I think that majority of the people that I bought from, it's been like that. Cool. I mean, we, I was going to move to this next part, but we just kind of got there naturally on our own. Um, So (laughs) essentially you want to be doing this not necessarily full time, but definitely grow and expand and you want to do this. How are, I was going to say, what are you going to try to kind of like market yourself as, or try to, because you touched on it a little bit about how, you know, when you were doing like the herbal stuff and lotions and the, and the hair care stuff where you enjoyed it. But once it got to a certain point, you were just kind of like, that's, that's enough. Mm-hmm. But into reptiles it seems like you already kind of have an idea of what you want to prioritize a little bit as far as not just like the no jesus i kicked my computer um all of the actual like projects or individual snakes or morphs like that but like as your business model yeah because you know I, i definitely want to um sell like a very um mixed form of like lack of better words designer morphs where they're a little bit on the higher end mm-hmm. but i want to also produce stuff that anybody can buy you know um for like all price ranges um and i want it to be affordable too i don't want you know but it, honestly what i've been getting into lately the things that i like does they don't tend to be too affordable so i still want to make sure i'm keeping in that middle market beginner market um and I don't think that I'm ever going to get to a point where I don't want to do this. I think that when it came to other interests, um, I don't know. I I guess I I can't really find where um, the difference is. You know, you you have interests. And Mm -hmm. um, I think the difference, I think I can actually speak to the difference. When it comes to the reptile community, it feels like a community. Um, I know it hasn't always felt like that. People talk about it being like cutthroat, like back. 10 years ago you know Mm -hmm. Um, and it's changed drastically in the last you know couple of years Um, but what I get I I have a sense of like community and family with people that I know in this industry and it feels great being able to connect with people it kind of touches on different aspects of my life like there's a social aspect of it and you're going to shows and you're meeting people you've uh, bought snakes from meeting people you've talked to online but never seen in person <clears throat> you know it, it touches on the excitement of you know seeing new life and you know being able to be a part of that and you know all that stuff so I, th- I just think that it stimulates it's a, it's a stimuli and stimulates different aspects for me in my life whereas when it comes to me um, doing my own hair and, you know, being able to, oh, if I have eczema and I can make this salve to, you know, cure this like little spot that to me is satisfying. It's, it's, you know, for different reasons, but doing it for someone else, for whatever reason, wasn't satisfying to me, (laughs) which is weird, but it just, it just didn't, it didn't do much for me. And I just didn't, didn't like the, the pressure. And then I think on top of that, you know, it's, it's very experimental when it comes to the herbs, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I don't know if I do, if I mix this and mix this herb together and put it in a salad, what it's going to do, but I can practice on myself. And when I'm successful, it feels good, but doing it for somebody else, all I'm thinking about is, damn, that's a lot of liability. (laughs) That's a lot of liability. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, like if I, if I do something just the wrong way, you're getting sued, but that might just be my claims adjuster in me. Cause I work for an insurance company and I just never, never felt like that was something that I wanted to get into. Um, so as far as precious pythons, you know, I just, I want to be well-known. I, I went into like the whole social media promotion and the YouTubing. And I don't even think I said this before, but I wanted people to know that when I started selling, I wasn't a scammer, that mm-hmm. I was genuine, that, you know, I'm a very authentic person and um, that, you know, I, I I went into this with, you know, good intentions, you know, um, and so that was, I just wanted to get myself out there. I didn't know it was going to pick up the way that it did. I had no idea. I, I thought I was going to be, you know, capped at like 200 subscribers year four. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, <laughs> I never thought that it was going to grow into this thing. Um, so my goal when it comes to, you know, building up this company, um, it's changed. And I think initially it was one thing, but now I can say that um, I want to see what it does for me as I continue to grow, you know, I want it to be as fulfilling as it's, as it's been. Um, and I want it to, want it to stay that way. And, you know, I want to provide that same experience to somebody else that I got, you know, when I first got into this hobby and not just that first, you know, time buying a snake, but just this experience. Like I know that breeders that I've bought from, I've met a few of them in person. I met I met Jake Milbride in person where he was just like, you know, seeing you buy your first bull python to you like starting up a breeding business and doing this and really pursuing this. He said, it's been amazing watching your journey. And I was shocked that I never thought about someone else, you know, who could actually speak to. I saw her buy her first snake asking me what she needed in her tank. And now she has a full ARS set up, you know, like it's yep. crazy, you know? So I would love to you know witness that you know within someone else's you know and I think that that's that that's where I can say like what I want to provide from a you know a business standpoint for somebody else just the same experience that I've gotten to you know have that's really cool I I really like that that's that's a lot better than a lot of people are just like I like snakes I like making pretty snakes um I want other people to have that too right but um I was gonna ask do you enjoy like do you get a lot of because you know you're fairly popular at this point um i mean brian bar checks or whatever may have you they don't count um, right <laughs> but do you have you do you get a lot of kind of regular interactions people kind of commenting or messaging you out of the blue asking for questions all the time um i get a lot of questions on my instagram uh where people will like you know hit me up and tell me that their snake isn't eating mm-hmm. um and I mean, it's so satisfying where someone will tell you, hey, my ball python isn't eating. And then you find out that this ball python is like 200 grams. It should be eating. Like there's no, I always, there's no reason. I know a lot of ball pythons have a bad rap about being picky eaters, but I always tell people, sure, there are several reasons why a ball python will go off of food, but there is no reason, absolutely none, why a baby or juvenile ball python should go off of food. They're actually the most aggressive eaters. Now, getting them on food from a, out of the egg is different than them being established on food. If they were sold to a person and they were established on food, there is no reason why they should stop eating if their yeah. husbandry was correct. So, you know, I've had people ask me those questions, small beginner, you know, ball python, fairly young, and I'll have them send me their setup pictures um, or information, and it's very clear after they do that, why the snake isn't eating. And then right. we'll just, I'll just go down this checklist of what they need to do. And then having them come back like a week later saying, Oh my God, thank you so much for your <laughs> advice. My snake's eating again. It feels great. Like, you know, it's just like, I love the questions. I will never, never, I know I, I talk to a lot of people that don't like it. Um, yeah, once, a lot of it. Get, yeah. Especially once they get past the point of where they're like running their full breeding business and, they got other stuff to do and think about. It. They don't want to, you know, <laughs> I, I still find it very, very much rewarding um, to know that there are people out here being helped because otherwise, you know, they have to learn by themselves and there's going to be a lot more errors and mistakes. And it might even, you know, um, I would say not inspire. It would, you know, uh, encourage someone to do their own research once they figure out all these things that they were initially doing wrong. Mm-hmm. I would think that it would encourage them to continue to do 
research to find out what else they're doing wrong and what else they can, you know, provide for their animal that's needed. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of questions on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you know, um, a lot of like the incubator builds and the um, tank setups. You have people asking questions about what they can and cannot do in reference to what I've done in the video. Um, and I think that's what it's been for a long time, you know, for the last two years. And here just recently in the last uh, few months, I've gotten a lot of the, what do you have for sale? You know? There um, it is. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's crazy because it's just like for the longest, it's been like, oh, you know, I don't have anything for sale. Like, you know, I'm still, I haven't had my first clutch. And, um, and now that's all about to change. So that's going to be now you're going to be making availability lists. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, and that's going to be in probably about a month because like I said, I have a clutch in the incubator that's about to hatch in two weeks. And then, you know, four to, you know, well, more than a month, but four to six weeks after that, hopefully they'll be on food. Hopefully they'll be sold. So um, it'll be definitely be, you know, an experience to share. And I think I might even kind of make a video like a final video once I consider myself a full breeder like once <laughs> I have gotten some snakes on food and then sent them out to their new homes I can talk about just the experience in general from beginning to what will be the end of you know well not the end but the beginning to like that that point of establishment like I am now a breeder and this was what this journey was like so I, I'm, I'm really excited to kind of share that with people that's really cool. I like that. Just kind of end of prologue, begin chapter yeah. one, precious exactly. pythons. That's really cool. <laughs> I actually like that title. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I mean, you could do it. That sounds like that would be a really cool book. I know a lot of a lot of people in the reptile hobby like that have come in the last couple of years. They really like the YouTube and stuff. But there's still so many people that just go back to the so a lot of the books of both yeah. reference books and yep. like the anecdotal ones. And that sounds like that could actually be a really cool book, you know? Yeah. You know? I would love to do that. I mean, like, <laughs> cause, uh, because... you're, yeah, your, your introduction to this has been very meteoric. I can tell you that. Like you just went woo yeah. really quickly, which is really <laughs> cool. I'm like, that's amazing. Thank you. It's definitely been a experience and I feel like it's absolutely a story because it just continued to evolve and evolve and evolve and evolve and evolve you know so I mean I hope it continues to do that too you know um I definitely think that my job after doing this has an expiration date <laughs> I'm, yeah, not I saying, I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying I plan on doing precious pythons full-time but I do not plan on doing my job full-time I know that you know <laughs> I know that eventually if I if I have like a very good you know career I guess doing this turns into something much more of this turns into like a business mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind having a very small part-time that I do seasonally or like you know whether it just be just part-time weekly but um I would much rather do this heavily and then have something on the side that holds me over during those dry seasons you know right. um and then eventually see where it, it picks up because I'm, I am very much about, my job is stressful. Um, it's very, very high intense job. And um, I'm more about peace of mind and, you know, money is just not that important to me. Like even um, I was talking to my friend Ryan about how like this could not take off. Like I could be doing horrible with sales and I would still do this because it's just that rewarding. It's not about the money. You know, obviously I wouldn't have like 300 bull pythons and just like, you know, eating myself into a hole, <laughs> but I would definitely keep a small collection and continue to breed regardless of what it was financially, because of that's how enjoyable it is for me. But I would easily quit my job <laughs> and do something small scale and take a pay cut to do something that I prefer and enjoy more, you know, than be stressed out and making all kinds of money. I just, that's just not the life that I envision myself having. Well, I'm really glad that's, I always got to keep that passion like right yeah. there. Um, and then not to uh, hopefully put ideas in your head, sorry, insurance company. Um, <laughs> but would you ever think about doing like the educational outreach programs and things like that? Cause you know, you already get a big fulfillment, personal, yeah. like personal fulfillment from helping people through their like hobbyist and, you know, husbandry issues. But being like what I aspire to be that weird guy who shows up at your <laughs> library with the big yellow snake. Right. Like, you know, I, I, I've been to two schools already. 
um, where I, you know, sit with the kids and nice. um, bring the snakes and um, they love it. I mean, it, it was so rewarding. But I, the second time that I went to a school, I realized the kids love it. I mean, you won't find a kid in there that's just like, even the little, the ones that are like kind of timid and a little hesitant, they're going to come up to you eventually. They're going to, when they see all their friends coming up and petting them, they're going to come up to you. It's the adults in the room that are like, you keep that snake over there. <laughs> they're terrified. They don't want nothing to do with it. And so I would, I stopped going to the schools because, because it's like, I'm reaching the wrong people. You know, I understand that these children grow up to be these scared adults, but at the end of the day, they're still children and there's that scared adult is their parent who won't allow them to have a snake. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you have to reach the adults somehow. You have to, you know, tear away that stigma of fear, you know, where Mm -hmm. I, I always tell people that, you know, there's no reason to be afraid of these animals. You know, you just have to understand that they require respect, respect, you know, um, unless it's a venomous animal, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's just no reason to be afraid of them. Um, so I would definitely be interested in like these outreach programs and looking into certain things, conservation, you know, um, I see myself doing this and I'm not talking about like breeding and precious pythons, but I see myself being very much involved in the reptile community as, you know, I continue to do this and um i'm looking forward to networking when it comes to Mm -hmm. going to shows and meeting i've already met so many people that are doing so many amazing great things and i want to be a part of that and yeah liberty mutual has a a expiration date (laughs) for sure (laughs) (laughs) so i don't know if it's going to be you know the next few years or the next decade but you know there's a clock ticking for that yeah always seems like that usually ends up happening as soon as you find something that it's like if I can get by and they can, you know, mostly pay for themselves, yeah. then Yeah. <laughs> definitely. So yeah, I think this is this is definitely um a, exactly what it is. It's a passion. And I I think I've been missing that. For I've I've had a lot of interest. Um mm-hmm. nothing I could say that's like a passion. I've had things that I thought were my passion. But it just didn't turn out to be that. And, you know, nothing that lasted almost three years that this has lasted. Um, but, you know, it feels it feels exciting all the time. Like, I'm just, there have been times, like, when I did my clutch video and I got my first clutch and I recorded it and I looked at the video and looked how excited I was. I, was, I looked goofy. I was like, you cannot post this. <laughs> you look crazy you know you're like you know the the excitement was just I couldn't even hide it but I decided at the end of it like no you have to post this this is authentic like this is you being you and you know people have to see this people have to see because there's somebody out there that is about to get their first clutch or about to give up on getting their first clutch because I know that my first year I thought I was going to have eggs and then I didn't get them and I thought I was doing something wrong and I was ready to throw in the towel and Ryan was like no you can't do it you're, you're so <laughs> close you know you're gonna get your you're gonna get those eggs and I, but I, I was ready to give up my first year because I was just like I thought I was going to produce something last year and when I did it it crushed me it crushed me and I was just <laughs> like I'm doing something wrong and I'm giving people advice and I don't even know what the what the heck I'm doing like you know this is it's too much So I posted that video because like I said, there's somebody out there that had that same feeling I had last year that that will inspire them to keep on going, keep on pushing, you know? Um, So yeah. (laughs) That kind of genuine feeling is actually, I think what makes the difference that you're, because there's always people in and out of the hobby that will always say like, Oh, they're just, they're just breed animals for money. They don't care about it. They're just chasing that dollar. They're chasing the view. But that kind of genuine, like, human reaction, feeling, and excitement of being part of that, you yeah. can't fake it. You just no. can't. No, and I tell people all the time, like, there's a different feeling. And I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't, need, I don't know what that sound is. <laughs> Someone's doing like, fireworks or something. <laughs> but um, I always tell people, like, that feeling, you know, extends to, like, other things and emotions. Like, if I were to lose one of my animals today, I would be a wreck. I would be devastated. Like I cannot explain that emotion. There are emotions tied to these animals um, that I like that are there, which is why I kind of want to continue to keep an intimate collection. I don't mm-hmm. want to, I don't want to turn into like a puppy mill. Not to come after any big breeder. You know, I'm not saying anyone else is doing that or running a puppy mill of snakes. You know, I just me personally, in order for it to 
to for that passion to stay there i need to connect with each individual snake and i don't know if i can do that on a really really large scale um so you know it's it's always gonna that emotion is always gonna be there tied to those animals and that's kind of how i want it to stay you know and i think that that's where i mean and i think for me that's where that excitement comes from i've i can attach you know personalities or just a feeling to this snake and then this snake has laid these eggs and you know some of that excitement is that too you know knowing that i was holding this snake in the palm of my hand two years ago and she just laid a clutch for me like that that you can't even describe that feeling it's amazing it's it's absolutely amazing so um i'm definitely looking forward to you know what what else this is going to provide for me emotionally and then mm-hmm. what it's going to provide for to other people that I get to sell to like you know so yeah that's really cool um I hate to go a little bit negative now that we've been going for a while but um I just kind of want to bring it up a little bit like have you ever had to go through like any struggles or hardships or like rocks in the road other than just like snakes not producing like have you had to deal with anything that could be like the end of this it's so, such a like a giant rock that like oh no like this is it this is what i'm gonna have to deal with i can't keep doing this and then anything like that yet well um i would say yeah like um <laughs> i decided to move from my apartment because uh my collection was expanding and they were doing like inspections and they just came out with this new lease in february saying that there could be no animals kept well before this year, there was nothing in the lease about um, tank animals, which, you know, reptiles are considered tank animals. Mm-hmm. There was nothing in there. So once they came out with it this year, I'm like, oh, and now I'm lying. <laughs> now I have to lie. And I don't do well with that. Like, I, I, I don't like being nervous about anything, especially when you're, you've invested so much money into, I've invested so much money into this hobby. You know, I just could not take that risk. And I was thinking, wow, you cannot do this anymore because I never... I was never going to be a person, um, I thought I wasn't, that was going to have this value of property that I have now, like owning property. I never wanted to. I live in a pretty spacious downtown apartment in Indianapolis, and I was fine living there with my son until he graduated from high school. Like, I was planning to live there for two decades. (laughs) Like, everybody in my family knew that I wasn't going anywhere. You know, Indianapolis is a fairly, really, really great city to live in financially. Mm -hmm. Um, Cost of living is amazing, you know, and- um, you know, you tell someone, yeah, I live downtown in a two bedroom, two bath apartment. That's really, really big. They think you're like loaded with money when in, in reality, I'm paying like $900 a month for an apartment, which is double in certain cities living downtown, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so when that new lease came out, I was like considering like, you have to choose, you're either going to be lying for the next decade, you know, about these animals, which is just stressful, or you can't do this anymore. Like, so what are you going to do? Like, so um I never thought that the option I chose would be to buy a house because I'd never like I'm I'm single like I think of having a house and I think I'm gonna be mowing grass and shoveling snow (laughs) cleaning gutters like you know I don't want to do any of that (laughs) but you know not to say that I can't but you know you I of course I was gonna take the easy route and everybody's like oh you can have your son do it but that still requires me to teach him like you know so all these things I just didn't want to do yeah um I didn't think that was gonna be an option but I overcame that, oh man, you might have to give up this hobby or cut it short or lie or whatever. Um, but I chose option C, which was buy a house. Um, and I think that that probably was the hardest decision I had to make with this um, hobby because it changes my life. It That's changes- a pretty big one. Yeah, <laughs> it changes my personal life. It goes from doing something for precious pythons to you're affecting your personal life you know what ha- happens if I had to consider like you have to buy a house where you can afford to take care of this mortgage for 30 years <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so you know it, it turned into something completely completely different and I would say that was the biggest adversarial moment that I had like you know dealing with that and making that decision um, where it was choosing between precious pythons and you know my personal life but I found a, a nice me i say i found it you know we'll see what happens you know i mean that yeah that's that's pretty big (laughs) that's 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 what stops a lot of people is either like a financial barrier they get burnt out they get spurned by the old timers 
or yep. something like that where they have to choose between you know the animals and the hobby or their current lifestyle and it yep. seems like yeah no you found the right way to go through it yeah <laughs> so I'm just hoping that you know um, it's everything that I hope it to be because um, my you know goal after I decided I wanted to get this house was I want to have a reptile room and I want to have a room dedicated to these animals because my, my apartment literally turned into a whole reptile where there's racks everywhere <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so now I get to kind of put you know what I envision my logo to be outside of the logo into a room you know um, I think everybody kind of sees their business and their logo and it means something to them and when they get their reptile room because I've been seeing a lot of breeders now buying trailers and putting in their, their backyards and building it up and decorating it how they see their business you know that, that that image of their business and now I get to do that it's not in a actual facility or outside building but it's in a room and I think that eventually that room will grow into a facility outside of my home whether it's in my backyard which that's what I would that would be my preference or, you know, somewhere where I have to, like, drive to or wherever, mm -hmm. um, I'm really looking forward to it. But like I said, I would prefer to have it as close by as possible. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I like, yeah, that's, it's, that's always nice. And then all yeah. of a sudden, yeah, because then you get your reptile room and you're like, that's nice. I like that. And then you get a really big boa and it needs a six yeah. foot cage. And so the only place you can put it is the living room. Yes. Exactly. And then you're like, I could fit another one right on top. <gasps> I could get two arboreal cages and we can put a carpondro and a jungle in there. <laughs> oh, and and then it takes over your whole house again. Yes, exactly. And like, oh, oh, now I have to get something bigger. <laughs> so yeah. Like... Yep. <laughs> that's really cool. I That's, that's absolutely amazing. I love I love that. I really love that. That's oh, that's really cool. Like I didn't realize I honestly thought you've been in the game a little bit longer than this. It's really, really cool. <laughs> not at all. Like not at all. But most people I think do because I think that you don't really start to see the value. I think people are hesitant to uh, invest a lot until they kind of see the reward first. Um, because I was scared. I'm just like, I always I mean I cringe when I think about all the money I put into it um best not to think about that part right it's because not. you know it's... you talk to anybody about like a business decision and you know it's never like investing a bunch of money up front you know that's a huge huge risk but huge risks come with high you know huge rewards you know if it, if it pans out the way you want it to um but i think that you know when you see people with um expensive morphs or certain morphs in their collection you think oh they had to have been doing this for a while because there's no way you'd spend that money without knowing if you would even be successful first you know um but I kind of just dived in like there was just no <laughs> it was head first you know dived in uh so I just had a feeling I just had this feeling that this was the right move to make you know yeah. so and it worked out so I'm really really well I don't know if it worked out yet it just feels right it all feels right and it has not felt wrong yet I mean all this seems like it's doing really well and it's <laughs> just going crazy like it's something that is very enviable right now is your kind of situation where it's you know you're 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 making it work you have the great animals you have the attitude you have the passion how you carry yourself it's absolutely amazing and it's now it. you're essentially building a house around a reptile room yes <laughs> yes because I, that's so funny that i know exactly what my reptile room is gonna look like i'm not sure what the rest of my house is gonna look like yeah, there you go <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah yeah um i'm really excited i think that you know the social media aspect was very important i know mm -hmm. that a lot of people get into this and they're so um hesitant and cautious about putting themselves out there on social media and it makes sense because the ball python community could be very unforgiving <laughs> very <laughs> that's the I'm nicest not... way i've heard it put honestly yeah. lately. <laughs> one wrong step <laughs> you're toast you're done you know so it's just like they could be very unforgiving but i could see why people wouldn't would be hesitant to put themselves out there especially um yeah i saw i saw a meme uh posted not too long ago that said um uh, it was to the effect of like it was like it was like betty white walking around with like a younger you know granddaughter looking girl and she was just like back in my day 
a breeder wasn't a breeder until they produced something, right? Like <laughs> anyway, that everybody now is a breeder in their first season of just collecting animals. Yep. And, and it was so funny because I read that and I commented on the post. I was like, I'm a breeder. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> I've know? never felt so called out in my life. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I feel attacked, you know, but it's just like, you know, I'm speaking this into existence. I am a breeder, you know, so even in that, in that respect, I never consider myself a breeder because I would call myself, I call myself a breeder, but it's not because I think I've bred anything or produced anything. It's literally because I'm all about positivity. And I think that what you speak and put into the universe, it gives it to you right back, you know? So I'm always going to like put that positive affirmation out there, you know, just because you, you create what you are, you know? And, um, when I decided to do this and do the social media, I told myself, you're going to be su- su- successful. And I promoted myself heavy, like to the point where I was like, I'm sure people are annoyed with me by this point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't, wh- what else can you do? You know, if you don't put yourself out there, if you don't promote yourself, if you don't ask for support, you're not going to get it, you know? And the worst thing that people can do is say no, you know? So it's just like, I just kind of decided to go all in with it. And I got a lot of positivity back so yeah that's great I'm, that's really really cool i love it that's i don't actually talk to too too many just ball python people mm. but everyone that i do it's so great i love it it's not <laughs> they haven't been scorn or put yeah. off yet they still just have that and i it makes it sound like i'm putting like a like an end date on it where like you're done after this point but no it's a genuine passion and caring that i absolutely love and i'm and i'm glad to see that it's still carrying on and still coming along for new people just getting in people that have been around for a little while and people have been around for a really long time that's really right. cool yeah yeah it's a very um interesting uh community um i love it you know and again you know i know that I, there's going to be like missteps and everything but that's just with life in general you know yeah it absolutely is and then you know putting yourself out there that's really hard too and yeah hey. yeah absolutely cool well um we're actually doing pretty good time we're at about an hour now so that's usually what i try to keep it about awesome. um really want to thank you so much for giving me your time yeah thank um, you for inviting me on it's been a great conversation no it's great i love just being able to just talk reptiles sometimes it's I I end up, especially like when we get a rapport going, I'll end up going, okay, let's talk about this. And then I look at the time and it's half an hour later. And we talked about it for like three minutes. Like, oh, okay. Well, hey, you know, that worked out too. Um, But I imagine at this point, most people who follow me also probably follow you. Um, But you'd be surprised, you know, like um, you'd be surprised like how many people are like I, there are people in the hobby that I've never heard of when people are like, how, you know, they're, they're this or they're that, you know, I don't think I heard about, I didn't hear about Billy mutation creation mm-hmm. for a while. And people thought I was crazy, but you know, um, that was around the time that I started like, you know, putting myself out there. So you, you just never know who knows of who, you know, it's just, I, I'm always surprised, you know, about like who starts following me or who I thought, you know, who I found out is following me that I I didn't think would ever follow me. So yeah, I I would definitely say it's a surprise when it happens. Yeah. It's just, uh, sounds like they're, uh, you're rolling with some big circles. Yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Not too much. I feel like, um, networking is so important. You know, (laughs) um, when I've met, um, some like Bob Vu and like Justin Kabilka at like the Arlington show, I was like fangirling. I never, I never knew that I would be so nervous to meet some of like the, the big time breeders and you kind of meet them and you're like, wow, they're just a person just like I, (laughs) you know, (laughs) so, um, but I wouldn't say I'm like connected in any way. I like to, I like, um, it would be great being able to mentor under some of those people. Um, but it feels just as good being able to have like people that you're just learning from, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's how I kind of maintain my mentoring it's it's with people that um i know personally and people that are beginning just like i am and we're kind of like learning together so cool yeah um well actually you know what here since uh it's kind of brought up really quick um when because you know networking it is very important it's again it's not just in this hobby it's not only what you know it's who you know too because sometimes that can not necessarily by like clout chasing or whatever they say these days because i'm old 
Um, you know, you're not just doing that, but it's actually, you know, doors can open just because of people that you meet and you think yeah. about things you wouldn't necessarily meet. Um, are you planning on vending any shows this year? If you're going to be producing a handful of fairly high end clutches right. where you wouldn't need, you know, a huge table, you could even probably like split a table with somebody, but you it's could probably come that. away pretty well and meet some interesting people. Some um, I sh- might, I say, sh- I was about to say should, but I'm still going to go with might because um, what I'm going to do is that when I have hatchlings, I'm going to mm-hmm. post them as available online. And I don't know how well that's going to do. And then my plan is to like, whatever is left over, I can take to like a close show, like the Midwest Reptile Show or Tinley, which is super close. Um, Schomburg, they're having a show June 19th that I will be vending, um, but it's not going to be animals I've produced. I'm going to take what I'm just letting go of my collection that does no longer fits into my plans, um, breeding wise, um, which, which I would prefer to do it that way anyways, just taking it to a show and just selling it off versus like putting, I don't want to sell anything online or on Morph Market that I haven't produced yet before I produce it myself. So I will be at the Schomburg show vending with Ryan. He will be selling um, some of his stuff um, and we're going to split a table just like you said yep. um, and then after that like when I do have like when I have produced some clutches and um, snake babies and I have some stuff for sale I don't know um, like I said I, I just my plan is to sell everything online and then mm-hmm. whatever is left over if it's if it makes sense and it's easy then I'll vend it at a, sh- a close show but my thing is like I never want to go to like Arlington with a huge trailer and drive down and like vend right. a show. It's a lot. It's a lot of effort, work, and energy. Um, and honestly, I don't see myself at a show being stuck behind a booth selling Fair animals. Enough. I see myself walking around and talking to everybody and see what what's available, you know. So, um, I, yeah, I can't say that that's a goal of mine just okay. yet. Yeah. No, hey, everybody has their own thing. I know a lot of people that are like they like the one-on-one interaction. They want to see who their animals are going to. And so they prefer that versus, you know, they're okay with the online interactions and they've, you know, committed to the shipping and all of the online, you know, legalities or handshakes or whatever may have you. And they're okay with that and they prefer that too. So, And I've gone back and forth too about like when it comes to like selling, um, especially online, and it's a nice animal, decently priced and, you know, you kind of want to know not even it doesn't even the price doesn't even matter you just want to know where your animals are going you know yep. i've got it gone back and forth with you know do i ask them you know if they have a enclosure already set up if they have mm-hmm. a, you know, what they plan on keeping the animal in and kind of just asking you don't want to offend anybody but again you just want to know that the animals are going to be well taken care of because one thing i know for sure is that um for example if i don't know how i would ever come about some information like this or know this but if i knew that somebody was a bad keeper or you had a you know, terrible husbandry practices. There's no way I'm selling to you. I'm just not, I'm just not going to do it. Um, I want to know that my animal, these are animals that I've grown up, animals that I care about. I want to know that they're going to homes to be properly cared for, you know? So um, I've kind of gone back and forth about like, am I going to ask that question? You know, does it matter? You know, like, I don't know. So it's tough. It's tough, you know, being a seller, Um, you know, so but I guess I have some time to, to think about like that, like what legalities are going to be, have to be set in stone when I'm selling online, you know, what's going to yeah. have to be established. I've always, I've always heard. And I think this is pretty good sound advice. Whereas you draw your line and then you stick to your line. Yeah. Where if that's like, okay, if this happens, it doesn't matter if it's a high end animal, if they have the greatest reputation, if they're pushing that line, just don't. Yeah. You don't need to tiptoe it. I agree. I agree. So there's definitely going to be something established along that uh, because the animal comes first. Above exactly. Everything. Yeah, that's that's always the the big thing that people like to come after um, the people in the hobby. It's but it's still the animal. It still comes first. It's still a living, yeah. breathing thing. Exactly. You obviously care about it. So it's... Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, so since my failed first attempt at uh, wrapping this up. Um, <laughs> So just in case there are anybody who are listening to this or watching this who don't know about Precious Pythons, where can they find you? So um, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube 
at Precious Pythons, all the same handle. And you can also visit my website, preciouspythons.com, um, where, and then I'll also be selling on Morph Market very soon and here in the next couple of months. And that will also be Precious Pythons. Cool. Do you have any merch for people to uh, pick up, hopefully, in the meantime? Yeah. Um, I sell all my merchandise on preciouspythons.com. I sell stickers, shirts, um, and hand sanitizer. So Nice. I like it. Cool. Well, thank you again so much for your time. I really enjoy just talking to just talking to people about reptiles. It's really cool. Yeah, I never pass up that conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Well, hopefully everyone enjoyed the show and we will check you next time.